Hey, we're going to go ahead and get started. Final panel. Um, I appreciate everyone to this point. Patience being here with us. I think we're going to get things kicked off a little bit. With our land, we're going to talk a little bit about land to start things off. Go through that. Um, get into other types of investments. Things Andy and I are doing. Things John's doing. Jay's doing. Guys down the line. Carter and the whole crew. Um, see how things just kind of play out. I was going to kick things off and start with uh, Dave Muth from the People's Company. Don't forget People's. I'm good friends with Steve. Steve's a super good dude. They got their conference going on next week. I'm not going to make it. I think Michelle and I are going to bolt out of here and go down to Florida. She's tapped. <laughs> <laughs> She's had enough. So uh, probably see Andy and the crew down there. And, but I, I, the People's Conference is always a good one. And uh, if you guys get a chance, head on up. But Dave, kind of walk us through, uh, through the years. And, you know, you guys have seen all kinds of deals come across your desk. I'm envious of some of the deals you guys have done and put together. And, uh, you know, what are some of the characteristics that you're seeing on some of your most profitable farms? I know you guys are into different things and nut farms and different, uh, different things, but what are some of the characteristics you're seeing as you guys run out the numbers on some of your most profitable ventures? Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Uh, not a very good sort of plug for the expo there, Kevin. It, it's a good meeting, but not good enough to skip Florida, right? <laughs> so, yeah, at least you know, for my wife, right? <laughs> she only goes with me on the Southern speaking tour not the northern North Dakota tour. Or, you yeah, know, fair enough. Yeah, Iowa in January. Uh, yeah, so, you know, the, there's, a, there's a few layers to that conversation in terms of uh, what we see that's most profitable, right? It, at the, the very top level, it, it's, it's the high quality ground, right? And so that cro cuts across um, permanent crops, right? Fruits and nuts all the way down to more traditional commodity row crops. But, uh, you know, the quality matrix is pretty discreet, right? Soils, topography, uh, infrastructure, access to markets, um, good labor pool, et cetera. Uh, certainly water uh, moves to the top of the list in certain regions and parts of the country. But that theme of uh, paying up for higher quality land uh, tends to pay back. It tends to be uh, the most profitable, uh, most biggest driver of profitability um, as we look across the deals that we've done. And uh, it, it gets interesting. There's certainly some opportunities to, to turn some higher cash yields on maybe some C quality ground, let's call it, uh, on a, a relative basis, depending on where you're at in the country. Uh, but what we tend to see is you're not necessarily going to capture those market up swings the same way and capture the total value at some point in a disposition. So, so we really do uh, see the highest profitability come in that, that highest quality. So if you could buy any farm, farm out there, what's your ideal farm to buy? Oh, that's an interesting question. So uh, we, we still love um, good high quality Midwest row crop ground. Uh, you know, the stability, uh, the, the track record is, is really uh, there, right? And we understand it. We understand the fundamentals. Um, we're doing a lot in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we like the stability of the water out there and the diversity of the crop production, the ability to respond to markets. And, uh, you know, w w so if, if I had to pin it down, it'd be in, in one of those two regions, I think. And one more I got for you. Where do you think farmland prices are headed the next uh, 12 months and then say a little further out, three to five? Yeah, so we've seen kind of a relative peak back in about April and May, and uh, it's softened marginally. Uh, the biggest piece is that the, the growth, right, that really fast pace of growth and values has slowed down. Um, there, the cost of debt capital is certainly a downward pressure. Uh, we're, we're seeing where supply is starting to come down in terms of land that's on the market. That's a, a pretty clear trend, uh, but demand has remained high, right? And so uh, when we look at what's happening transactionally right now, uh, we're just seeing a lot more cash deals, and we're seeing the uh, demand from folks that are able and willing to do cash deals uh, is sort of an inverse pressure to that downward pressure from uh, uh, the standpoint of the cost of debt capital. Uh, so looking out uh, 12 months, generally we would anticipate some settling. It's not clear that it's going to be really dramatic. Uh, when we think start thinking about three and five years, I mean, the trend lines in farmland are pretty clear. 
right? If you go back and you look at, it's about 53 years worth of data from USDA reporting state level farmland values. And of the lower 48 states, 46 of them all fall between uh, five and 7% on annual appreciation of farmland over that long term. And, and so the, the fundamentals uh, are dictating that those trends over a longer term when we start to get out to five are, are gonna hold. And we haven't quite overshot trend line as much as people think. Uh, it certainly feels like in parts of the country we've uh, really accelerated these values a lot, uh, but we were actually lagging behind that long-term trend line from uh, sort of a commodity price lull there for several years. So uh, we think that, that we're gonna continue to, to sort of operate along that same trend line that's existed for a very long time when we start getting out into that kind of five-year range. Perfect. I'm sure we'll have some debates here as this panel goes on uh, with some different perspectives. Let's talk to uh, Chris Bauman, founder of Cash Rents. He survived one year. He didn't get lynched. He's still alive. Um, Chris, what are we seeing for rents happening out there? Not only on farm ground, but say on rec and hunting ground. I, I don't want to steal your thunder, but you told me there you guys just booked a really pricey rent again. Here we go with these crazy rents happening. So, Chris, take it away. Well, I, this working? Got it? Yeah. Perfect. I did make it back for this year. I don't know. How many people were here last year? So everybody pretty much doesn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> we refer to this event now as Beatdown, not FarmCon. <laughs> it's always good to take a shellacking, but I want to know my audience. How many in here own land and don't farm? Fair amount of people. How many are just landowners that farm ground and rent ground? Okay. Now that I know what I'm dealing with, I can tailor my speech. A couple of key takeaways. Everybody pretty much knows what we do. We're an open, transparent marketplace that connects landowners with quality tenant farmers. A couple of things I've learned through last year and this year. Every farmer sitting out there is smarter than the farmer next to him. Vice versa. Okay. Every landowner out there is very generous. I have talked with a lot of landowners over the last 36 hours that literally write a check to their farmer for $100,000, $200,000 a year because their ground's undervalued. Got a guy on my team, he came up with a good analogy and they said, well, we really like our farmer. And they said, well, do you like him enough to give him a $200,000 check in his Christmas card? Well, no, I don't like him that much. That's what this is all about, is an open, transparent marketplace that finds price equilibrium. It's gotta work for both. We have to drive value for both the farmer and the landowner, but in conversations and just doing quick math prior out in the lobby, landowners are leaving millions and millions and millions of dollars on the table every single year because they're not properly educated. Now, everybody says, well, I'm driving up rent prices. No, I'm not. I don't control the rent prices. It's a marketplace. We're all clear on that. It's the farmers bidding on the ground. And when Kevin asks, where do I see rent prices going? Rent prices are astronomical right now, and we're setting records almost at every turn. Right now, this last year, our average increase for landowner ROI and cash rents was up a little over 40%. That's staggering, absolutely staggering. We're seeing people that were getting 260 are now getting 450. We're seeing people that were getting 270. We hit a $620 dollar auction with 12 bidders and 69 bids on 109 PI ground that was about 210 bushel corn. So from our perspective, rental rates are continuing to rise. And I think as long as we maintain you know, stable commodity prices where they are, I don't know where commodities are gonna go. If I did, I wouldn't be sitting here right now, I'd be a commodity trader. Um, but definitely the trend is going up. I, yeah, I appreciate it. I was, when they told me, I thought I'd heard of some $500 rents up in their neck of the woods and the 625 was kind of through 620 kind of tossed me. I'm like, oh boy, here we are back. 
But remember, the last time we were at plus 600 rents. <laughs> and, and keep in mind, these. Hey, what, what's, Andy, what, what's, what what's, Andy? what's weird for us is, you know, I, 20 times out in the lobby bar that night, somebody's like, well, they can't make money. They can't make money. That's just a flyer. That just wasn't one bit. That was like four or five different guys. That One guy was at 620. One guy was at 618. One guy was at 617. So these aren't outliers and just one-offs where they're trying to steal the ground. These are very competitive bidding processes, and we find it a, a myriad of reasons why. And it's, hey, this farmer might be 65 miles away, but he farms in a swath, and he wants to keep that going. He wants to keep that combine moving in that direction, and he's hungry for more, for more ground. And as, as farms consolidate, as generations continue to grow, we all know what's happening with farming families. More and more kids, more and more mouths to feed. They have to grow their acreage to support the family farm. And we don't dictate why somebody places a bid that they, they place. It's, and it's up to them, and we leave it up to the landowner, provide them the diligence, and say, you make the decision. High bid doesn't win. Maybe you don't want a farmer that lives 65 miles away. Maybe you want a farmer that lives 10 miles away and drives past it and picks the garbage out of the ditch. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. So. No, oh, yeah, I, I just find it interesting that we're back in those times again on the uh, crazy high rents. We'll, we'll see. I mean, I don't know. Like I said, it's not uh, sustainable if it's not profitable. So I'm not sure it's sustainable at some of the levels we're at now. As Chris said, the commodity pricing notoriously corrects itself or historically corrects itself uh, just from some overproduction standpoints, supply and demand standpoints and the balance. I remember Andy, the, we could go into it again. The last time him and I, we were at a top producer conference and I don't know when it was. We're sitting down at the bar and I'm not kidding you. There were five guys, three or four guys come up and tell us they were extending runways because they'd got a lot bigger planes and they bought these massive planes and there's $600 rents being tossed around. Andy just looks at me, and we were both traders, and he's like, I'm going to race to get on a phone. I'm selling as much corn as I can possibly sell. He's like, we need to sell with both hands right here. And I said, why is that? And he's like, I just, he's like, the few times in my life that the farmer's all bulled up, he's like, that is the time to sell. And it was the high. It was the high that day. Within 24 hours, yeah. Within 24 hours, I mean, the market never went back. And I was like, oh, my goodness. So, I'm not saying it's the high, right? I just, it's interesting to hear the, the talks and the uh, lingo going around. So uh, I'm sure you guys want to ask plenty of questions too. So we'll try to get to that. Is this the last session of the day? And we'll close things out. But Carter Malloy with Acre Trader. I know uh, your company is seeing some sizable growth. Um, how much interest is coming from outside the traditional ag space? Uh, and do you see that trend continuing to grow, Carter? We do. So for, for our business, we, we connect farmers with growth and growth to growth capital from individual investors. Those individual investors, there's a, a disproportionate amount of farmers and rural Americans in there to, to be clear, right? There's tons of farmers who are in Iowa, they own ground there and they want to divert, they understand the value of land. They want to diversify out and so they'll use our platform to invest in, in Georgia or Idaho, uh, where, wherever that, Australia for that matter, uh, if they'd like. So we do have lots of farmer investors on our platform uh, but the large majority of, of the thousands of investors that, that use our platform are not inside of the industry every day. Again, lots of ag professionals, lots of folks in this room are, are customers of ours, and uh, that's exciting for us. But we're also excited to bring new sources of capital to rural America. So we, we work with you know, lots of folks that are second generation, it's grandkids, and they've moved out, but they still want to be invested in U.S. farmland. Uh, we work with people across the gamut. It's important that they're all U.S.-based. It is all U.S.-based investors. Uh, but we work with all kinds of people on that side of our business. On the other, the, the supply side, as you think about folks that bring land in that may be for sale, uh, the, the best source for us by far and away is farmers. So we work with farmers all throughout the U.S., uh, I think 19 states so far and, and growing, where they say, hey, I would like to invest in this land, but you know, maybe I've got some money, but I may not have $3 million to go take this down, and I don't want expensive debt or uh, some, some big firm in here. And so they'll work with our team to go raise some capital uh, to grow their business. So we, we deal with, you know, this thing about our business being a two-sided marketplace, we deal with lots of kinds of people. And it's pretty simple with most businesses. If we can make it a win for people on both sides, for the farmer we're working with and the investors we're working with, then we can continue to scale our company. Perfect. 
Um, switch over to uh, Landgate. <clears throat> Craig couldn't be here. And I, excuse me, I forgot your name. What was it again? Uh, it's Jensen. Jensen, I forgot. Craig couldn't get here. His daughter broke her leg. Had a bad uh, leg break, correct? Yeah. Um, you better pull it closer to you. She, she broke her leg uh, sledding on Christmas, so there's yeah. a good present. So he's having to deal with her. He called me last minute pretty much and kind of just said, hey, I'm going to have Jensen step in. We talked, Jensen and I, and, you know, tell us a little like you guys see uh, from your end at Landsgate for alternative plays for farmland. What are you seeing come in as interest on the d demand side? Yeah. Um, so Landgate, first off, we're a competitive marketplace, very similar to some other platforms out here. And I would say the biggest thing that we're doing is bringing in a whole new funding structure, people interested in your land. Uh, these folks are looking to... These folks are looking to develop, you know, solar, wind, carbon, energy, oil and gas mining, um, and they're using Landgate to directly connect to you all, the landowners. Um, the big question that I've been getting throughout this conference, it's my first time uh, here, so thank you all for the warm welcome. It's been awesome. Uh, but um, Landgate is free. Anybody should go on there, and you should know the value of your land. Uh, we've, we've found a really good use case that People know what they, they think their land is worth, but you don't truly understand that until you have something validating it with hundreds and hundreds of points of data um, using technology to you know, figure out what your land is truly worth. Uh, so Landgate's bringing together all of this into one platform and making it really easy for you all, landowners, developers, farmers, anybody to figure that out. Uh, and then look at potentially a solar, wind, any energy resource that you want. Uh, so that's that's what we're doing. And uh, in terms of like capital, yeah. uh, we're seeing like Landgate is great because like we're using, we have developers, solar, renewable, all sorts of developers using us every day to find their next project. Uh, we're seeing a ton of demand for solar and then battery storage. Um, anybody who's near a transmission line, substation, anything with power, uh, you should post it up on Landgate really quickly and get some offers in there. Really? So, yeah. That's that's what I would encourage everybody to do. Um, look it up. It's free. We can give you an in-depth report. And I'm sure everybody here has <coughs> had somebody come to their land and try to buy or lease or something. Um, you now, with Landgate, have the advantage, and you have more data points than I would guarantee that person who came to your land to give you a credible, know what your land is worth for solar, wind, carbon, oil and gas, mining, whatever revenue or energy resource you want, you now know more than that land man or whoever's coming to your land. And it's all free. Perfect. And I think that's an important uh, takeaway as we move forward. And Shane, kind of tell us, Shane Hutchison, um, tell us what you guys are seeing and what you guys are doing on the finance side or you're seeing uh, different financing opportunities come up. Yeah, you know, 2022, Kevin, was, was really a, a challenging year after we kind of got used to the low interest rates of the previous years and uh, then the Fed finally realized that you can't increase the money supply by 40 percent and not have consequences and subsequently you know rates doubled over the past year and so uh, if you got financed and uh, before they went up congratulations because I don't think we're going to see those rates uh, back down to that level anytime soon but uh, as far as the one people that do finance we are seeing in my market and I cover the Mississippi Delta area so Apologize for the accent, but uh, but things uh, things have pulled back a little bit because a lot of the people that finance feel like there's uh, things are out of balance between rents and land values and interest rates. And with the interest rates over over doubling, uh, many buyers feel that this is going to need to adjust. And you know we've seen these rates before back in 2008, <coughs> 2009, but uh, land values were significantly lower right now, and so. Uh, really, the buyers in our market, um, you know, have been the uh, the cash guys, the the ten thirty one, and those guys are paying, you know, we're paying a ten to ten to fifteen percent uh, premium over the market. But uh, but overall, you know, business has slowed last year, and um, you know, we're doing some different things with, with our financing. You know, when I started my career, you know, twenty year am was the typical amortization on the loan, and now we're we're seeing thirty and forty year amortizations and even more people looking to do some interest only type financing. So uh, some different things there. Uh, when it, one of the challenges too we're seeing in the financing side is you know, with these high land values, you know, uh, historically 
you know, we finance, you know, 65%. Uh, but right now, if you look at land, you're figuring Illinois is, you know, selling for $20,000 an acre. You know, a 60% 60, 60 loan, that's $12,000 an acre. And so while we haven't put any caps on or had any, had any pullback yet there, uh, we're certainly, certainly keeping an eye on it. So that's kind of what we've got. Do any of you, anybody think we're in a land bubble? You don't want to raise your hand probably, right? No lynchings? Uh, there's a lot of cash out there, Kevin. Yeah. I mean, and it's hard to imagine, you know, something, uh, something outside, something's going to drive the commodity prices down, I yeah. think, for land values to come down. Andy, anybody? Anybody in the audience think we're in a land bubble? Probably don't want to raise your hand either. Anybody bearish land? I think we could go, you know, we're, we've reached our peak here. Anybody bearish? Anybody yeah. bullish land? Anybody awake? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to raise hey, it. I love that. Kevin, I'll, I'll, I'll pipe in. Uh, Twenty-five or $30,000 an acre uh, for, for some of this high 100 bushel corn is, doesn't pencil very well. Yeah. But the, the reality is, is for most of us here in the room, uh, it, you, know, you, can, you can time your trades all you want to, but you may only get a shot at that piece of land once in your life. And if you're looking at a land over a, a lifetime or even a 10 or 20 year period, and you're buying even at bubble prices, it, it matters less that you time it well on the entry than it does that you buy through cycles. And so it's, it's a, a fool's errand. I'm actually kind of happy that the room's not throwing their hands up with brave, crazy predictions, because the reality is none of us know. Uh, but, but we do know that over long periods of time, there's real value in this asset and what it grows. And so I think, I think maybe I'd, I'd rephrase it and say, I think we're all very bullish long term. Yeah. I've, I have no idea in hell what's going to happen the next year. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm wildly bullish farmland. Probably my most favorite investment. But there's few reasons why. I've had this argument through the years, but... At this current time, I've even learned more reasons why. Because we're, we're all myopic in our views. So we only view things from our perspective, right? So you're only viewing them from your perspective, whether you're growing corn, beans, wheat, whatever it may be. You're myopic. We all are. But I started buying uh, historical homes. So my accountant said, hey, you got to do something different here. You, you know, start buying historical homes. So we started buying and redoing some across the country. We have one right here. Um, and it spits off, it's a historical home. We turned it into two units upstairs, got a carriage house outside. It's spitting <clears> off about $30,000, $35,000 a month in clear revenue from Airbnb. The kids cocked us into switching everything to Airbnbs, all right? You wonder why housing prices went up and, sky, and stayed supported? A lot of people look at it as a different asset class now. You can do different things with it. We buy one-off buildings now so we went from the historical homes we're still doing some of those but now we buy one-off buildings and most of our buildings are averaging between a million and five million dollars somewhere in there we sold a few uh, at the peak we sold a couple and we've replaced them with a couple but they're unique type buildings in prime locations but we use all kinds of alternatives whether it be for wedding venues airbnb plays it's all kinds of alternatives right What'd the land gate guy say? If you've got land that's next to a quilt or next to an electrical facility, if you have land that's next to something that somebody wants to buy it for batteries, Google, Amazon, they're all putting in new facilities through the Midwest. The preacher, uh, Philip Kelly, he's going around coaching these people that are building these new Google facilities and data centers through the Midwest. You guys have seen them. These look like a prison and they've got barbed wire going up around them, that's to house data and their data. Just as we store oil in the Midwest, now they're storing data in the Midwest. Now you've got bidders for solar. Now you have bidders for uh, wind energy. Now you have bidders and buyers from CPGs that are looking to close the loop on agriculture. They're going to buy the farm, farm the ground, close the loop. Do you hear what I'm saying? Just in housing, like you had new buyers come in, there are so many new buyers hitting the marketplace in land. It seems to be pretty crazy. I know there's some people in the audience that are seeing similar things. So I'd probably say I'm wildly bullish because I think you're still early 
But I think there's going to be more and more players looking to buy land for things that we don't even, we can't think of. You don't know what you don't know. Hell, we're looking at, oh, my farmer next to me can't possibly make this pencil. Well, it ain't going to be the farmer next to you that's probably going to be bidding on the ground eventually. I mean, this is moving to levels now where it isn't maybe going to be the farmer. You know, it's some of these bigger swaths of ground we've seen bought by Microsoft, Google, Amazon, other players, and how they're going to go about and make their moves or redirect their, their allocations of money. So I think you got to be careful. I mean, <clears throat> I've never seen a market in a bubble where everybody, all the buyers are sitting on the sideline waiting for a break. That's not a bubble. You're in a bubble when everybody's selling. When I put my hand, when I ask people, hey, do you think we're in a bubble? In smaller groups, a lot of people will raise their hand. And I say, well, perfect then. You want to sell your ground? <laughs> all hands go down. Well, that's, they're, they're, not, they're not sellers. When you had the silver bubble, like I told you guys before, you know, when silver raised, every mom and pop and grandma was going out selling silverware, candlesticks, and anything they could get their hands on, they were all sellers. So you had more sellers hitting the market than you had buyers. When you got more sellers hit than buyers, you got a chance to rock it down in a hard, hard way. In this room, I could ask everyone in this room, would you be a buyer if prices broke a little bit of land? You're all sitting doing the same thing I'm doing, waiting on prices to break a little bit before you buy. Yeah. Usually isn't the case, right, Daddy? That's... It's a little tricky there. I mean, when we're all sitting with money on the side, that's why I'm a little worried about the stock market. I mean, hell, we're all sitting here with money on the sideline. We're all got tons of dry powder because we all think it's going to break. Well, I don't know. I don't know if there's a lot left on the break. Maybe. I mean, we'll get into that debate here in a minute. But maybe. Um, but I'm telling you, there's just a lot of alternative buyers coming into this land market that I had never even envisioned would be buyers. Like he's talking, you know, people that are building batteries or people ponying up next to other installations, right? You know, go ahead and talk on that. Yeah. And I would say like the buying is definitely an aspect and the buying is we see a ton of buying, but I would say the even more popular thing is the lease. Uh, you should, we know land is valuable. Everybody should hold their land as long as they can pass it on to their kids and do whatever you want with it. But generating alternative revenue from your land or an underutilized piece of land is something that companies will pay a lot of money for and they'll pay for a lease as well uh, and with i mean land gate and there's a m bunch of other data sources out here like you don't know what you have until you're fully informed and like technology is not going away and we need to use technology to the best of our advantage and now it's hitting land and it's hitting leases and it's hitting for sale um, and so we're seeing like tons of capital coming in through Landgate coming to buy or lease more often than not leasing land to find their next project and develop solar, develop wind, develop carbon, whatever they're looking at. Like all these companies have so many different goals, uh, but this lease aspect is something we're seeing a ton of capital coming through using, using our platform and finding their next project quickly and closing quickly. And if you think about it like Uber or Lyft, I mean, those were just assets you had sitting around. Someone said, Hey, here's some people with some assets, they have a car, we could do something with that. Airbnb is the same type of play. You have an asset, maybe it's not being used all the time. You got a room, it's not being used. How can we make that? We've looked at it many times, like how many people in the room have hopper trucks sitting around all, how many assets you got sitting on the farm and you're not using? It's like, gosh dang, you would think there'd be some money, you know, like you could come up with something with the assets that are sitting around the farm is like, aren't being used, like how could we, I don't know. We've I've kicked it around a million different ways, but with land, I think you're seeing the same thing. And that's kind of exactly what we're talking about: is the alternative uses that are going to come in for an asset that that it may surprise us, just because we're only looking down the pipe of what we know: corn, beans, we or however whatever's on our farm. So, what are your opinions, Andy? What do you what are you thinking on the land? Um. Well, I, I have a, a pretty bad taste in my mouth as a land investor, so I guess I'll uh, keep my mouth shut. I've invested in uh, Brazil, and that uh, didn't turn out so well. Um, probably lost 80 cents on the dollar. Had some of the smartest guys, many of them in this room, Soren, my brother Chip, the Hooties, Kevin, a bunch of us bought a lot of farmland down in Brazil, and uh, we bought it 13 years ago, and 
when you found out by the time you get down there that there's uh, corruption, there's uh, um, a lot of things that, uh, and, and certainly the uh, Real, which was trading about 1.7 to 1 at the time, is now trading about 5.4 to 1, was uh, probably the kiss of death. But it, it's, it hasn't worked well. Um, Sora and I have some land we bought over in Romania, um, and that's, that's done well. But, you know, 10, 12 years later, it's finally doing well. It took a while to get it. I mean, they, they took all these little, you know, hectares, two-point hectares here and a hectare there that was all part of the old communist plots and put them all together into big 30,000-hectare um, farms with modern farming day practices, and, and it's, it's transformed that land into something that's more viable and commercial. But, you know, um, <clears throat> that's been a long, long road to hoe. So I, I, I guess my personal experience isn't nearly as... Uh, Exciting is is uh, what many people have had and the success others have experienced. I appreciate it, Jay Felton. What uh, what are you seeing on your end? Jay's uh, one of our attorneys and with Lathrop and Gage and works with a lot of people in the ag space. What are you seeing? Changes come down the pipe. What do you, what are your views on land? Well, we're seeing. I'm seeing the same thing you're all seeing, which is that land prices continue to march forward, six uh, percent uh, per year, and you do that over 20 years, and things triple. And it's just happening. On top of that, my friend Todd reminded me that we also have something called inflation that people haven't been thinking about for a while, and that's going to impact land prices as well. I think the main thing that concerns me, because I also think land prices are going up, is nobody thinks land prices are going down. And that kind of concerns me, because when we all think the same thing, we all, we all start uh, wondering if we're thinking wrong. So I kind of try to do a pre-mortem so under what scenarios, I'm gonna ask Andy or Kevin or one of you guys to tell me, under what scenarios can we draw out where land prices go down 10, 20, or 30 percent? Vargo. Okay. Yeah, I mean you get corn prices to break back down sub four bucks and you get interest rate. Guys are having to lock in, you know, an interest rate on a on a on a working line of capital that's plus five, six, seven, eight percent. I mean, you're gonna have some problems. I mean, there's no question. Did you guys see the stat, though, the other day that they put out? 80% of farmland in Iowa is owned outright. Not one, no mortgage on it. Now, yep. That's... There's, there's still a lot, the last thing I'll say, there's still a lot of money sloshed around looking to get in the land, and we've talked about it up here, but it is uh, a great diversification play for a lot of people that aren't in this room that are looking to try to find ways to hold additional assets, assets that can generate regular income, assets can, that can hold value and have steady growth. And there's a feel-good part of being part of farming. The quote that we heard yesterday was, I was born on this land, and I will die on this land. I know people like that. I am like that. So and a lot of us don't want to sell our farm. So it, it's a weird marketplace. I just think it's going to be an interesting time as we move, move forward. I just expect it to be a little choppier, Kevin. And you probably see, Jay, a lot of uh, legacy plays. I always told everyone one of my favorite legacy stories I had when I was trading in Chicago, one of my clients was a lawyer, and he had bought farm ground through Missouri, and he had planted it all, and he continued to buy ground. And him and his wife would plant, I don't know whether it was 25 to 45 acres of black walnut trees every year. Him and his wife would go out every year. Clockwork. It ended up being what they left for the family and the kids. So each kid got, I don't know whether it was 200 acres. I think it was 150 to 200 acres of black walnut trees, the, the daddy ones. I mean, produced the great walnuts and a lot of money for the wood. And in the will, it was, you know, you cut down two or three trees a year, four trees to live off of, and you plant, you know, double that. And your family will be set up forever. And I've seen a lot of people make some great legacy plays with land and looking to do some alternative things with land. So I know a lot of people in here, you know, looking to do things for their kids and things of that nature, but it might be an idea for you to toss around as a family project that continues and carries forward. So interesting stuff. But. Yeah, just make sure you have a plan. I mean, the government will tell you what's going to happen to your resources when you die, if you don't want to decide that. But decide that and talk to the people that you love that you want to have that ground or that operation when you're done and sit down with them and have those conversations and have it written up and follow it. And if you do that, you're going to leave that legacy. Uh, if you don't leave it, the government will tell you what's going to happen. And if 
I know th th this sounds like a huge number, but after $26 million, couples will start paying pretty high estate taxes. And uh, if you think land prices have doubled, tripled, quadrupled, you know, you can get there faster than maybe you might think. Uh, so plan ahead. Yeah, I agree. Make sure on this one, we will get to questions. I promise. Um, you can text them in as we're going. We'll probably switch gears here a minute off the land. I know there'll be lots of stuff. Um, John Purifoy, John's with us in person. Talk about the crypto space just a little bit. Talk about FTX, maybe what's happened, if there's any contagion, uh, where we're headed with some of the crypto investments that some of us may still have on. Uh, and, you know, fire out. John, take it away. Well, first off, I heard you guys were looking for a bubble earlier. <laughs> If you uh, need one. Uh, first off, it's great to be here, guys. Thanks so much for having me. I'm John. A uh, little different world than land. Yes, I work in cryptocurrency and those things involved. So if you're looking for 20 cents on the dollar, I can probably get you back on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I really resonate with a comment from both Dave and Chris around this idea of investing, don't speculate. Right. I think when you look at a lot of the pretty ludicrous returns that you've seen in the cryptocurrency space and beyond, I think a lot of people have this mindset of doubling and tripling, not taking years, but taking days. Uh, and, and Wallace, that's awesome. I think investing is a little bit of a smarter way to do it. And so I think those are the conversations that we have. Right. So my background is I work at a firm and we're a brokerage firm for institutions. Right? So we help them buy, sell different cryptos, working with hedge funds, asset managers, pension funds, things like that. <laughs> and so to me, I think, you know, I think the question is, how do you invest in something for the long term? And I think maybe some interesting factoids about that, right, because you were asking, like, where's the prices and kind of where do we think? Well, I split the question of prices into two buckets. I think there's a macroeconomic question here, which is where, what actually happens on a large scale? Where do rates go? Where does the stock market go? How do the geopolitical tensions really factor into that? I don't know the answers to that. Agreed. If I knew the answers, I'd be a commodities trader or a very smart man. Uh, so, but, but I think that's one space, and I think generally people recognize that it's going to be a while that we're going to experience some downturn. I think the other side of that, which is if you want to go in the crypto land in particular, I think you have actually seen us very strong weed out of bad apples. Right? The FTX collapse, notably, was not one day in the making. Right? You're talking about institutions who over long periods of time defrauded investors and altogether perpetrated frauds. And I think in the crypto space, that's really what we need. Right? You're seeing other questions come into play with some other large groups like Genesis, things like that. But I think generally speaking, you're weeding out the bad apples. You know, For my granddad's birthday one year, I bought him some Bitcoin. Uh, he think he thought he was going to go to jail. Uh, and he always used to call it Bitcoin. Uh, which, which, which was just the greatest expression. But the reason I say that is I think that people have had this perception that cryptocurrency has a lot of bad actors in it. I think that statement's been seen true, but I think that's good because I think then you'll clear them out and you'll make way. I think the other side of it is there was a comment earlier about land having a lot of new buyers. Crypto has that like times 100. When you start thinking for a minute of all the actual use cases of the technology when these things are reasonably priced, how people can send money across borders or use it for internal settlement systems, I think that's awesome because the transactional costs really haven't come down. And I think it's pretty crazy that you can go from selling a crop from 17 cents to a broker to it being $3.50 in a store. And if you think that's a problem that's only in agriculture, you're wrong. That's a problem in finance in general. Intermediaries have made transaction fees, credit card fees, and everything sky high, and we all have accepted that reality. That is a terrible reality to accept. So it makes me super excited to work in an industry where we're about building technology that disintermediates something, building technology that truly enables people to have a more free and open world. So the amount of new buyers on that is just absolutely crazy. You see people looking at it for diversification of portfolios. Right? You see pension funds or other groups saying, okay, maybe 2% of my wealth goes in here. You see banks using this on the back end to use that for their internal operations. And you see people just kind of being involved in different communities, helium, things like that. So for me, when I come to this question of like, all right, where does crypto go and like what's going to happen? I think in the short term, it's going to be dominated by the macroeconomic spectrum. I think that's pretty obvious. But I think more long term, yeah, I think there's a lot of fundamental things that are really starting to make it look good. 
But yeah, I wouldn't time the bottom. I, uh, I don't think that'd be a good thing for anyone to do. So I think the better idea is invest, right? Don't speculate. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of how I think about that and kind of where it goes into the future. But I will say it's been one hell of a run. Yeah. What, uh, what do you like the best still? Um, for the average everyday investor. Yeah. So I think I'd say two things about it. One is I think dollar cost averaging is the name of the game here. Right. I, if you're going to buy, you know, let's say 10 grand or 100 grand of Bitcoin or whatever, please don't buy it today. Buy a very small portion today. Say over the next six months, you'll allocate the remaining amount. In terms of assets, if you guys want to hear my crypto pitch of the week, um, more than happy to. And if you ever come and want to say hi, please do. My email is john at floating.group. Uh, john at floating.group. So I'm happy to give ideas at any time. John, tell them where you're from. Oh, What's yeah. It? Sorry. I haven't given the whole thing. Uh, I'm from Springfield, Missouri. Uh, so hello to any Springfieldians out there. There are 34 Springfields in the U.S., fun fact. Uh, I went to school up in Boston, MIT, and then I started this company about four years ago. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been an awesome ride. We're now like 30, 40 people. We operate here in Singapore and California. Um, and we, yeah, I honestly get to do really awesome things, and I get to enjoy every day, which is awesome. Um, but yes, anyways, I think if you're thinking about interesting things in crypto, I think people mostly know Bitcoin and ETH. I think when you start looking outside the top 10, you'll find some really, really cool assets. People that are putting identities on the blockchain, people that are using smart contracts to look at what data and different supply chains, things like that. So I think crypto's got a lot to offer the world. I think it's just going to take a while to get there. Yeah, perfect. I'm sure we'll have some questions flying. Um, <laughs> John's got a lot of energy. He's fired up. He ain't messing around. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. You from a farming background, John? Uh, my got... granddad used to have a farm or has a farm down in Texas. He unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but my, the story that I've been obligated to tell, and I will apologize this, uh, we used to work cattle every summer. Um, oh. And I will say the most painful thing I ever did uh, was have to work cattle. Uh, when they're young to make the guy cattle less aggressive. Uh, that's where we'll stop that story. But, uh, Is that politically correct? Right. right. One hell of a job. Let me tell you why. Uh, that's funny. So, mm -hmm. Andy, let's uh, bring it back. You know, Andy always is a... Uh, I always love when I look at my phone and it's a call for me. Andy and I is like, hmm. Well, I wonder if we're just going to shoot the bull here a little bit or what, what <laughs> investment idea is going to come around the next corner. So we've had many, many. I was on a call last week. We were on a call about uh, nuclear waste and, you know, investing in a company that's uh, going to do some things with nuclear waste. We've, I've been on calls about toothpicks. I've been on calls. It's all along the border, right? And I mean, it can go anywhere. You never know what may be come around the next corner to invest in. So Tell us some of your favorite ones, one of some of your fun ones, crazy ones. Good yeah, well, you know, I, I, I don't really tend to uh, be too conventional in terms of my, uh, my, my uh, investing portfolio. I'm more private equity, venture capital. Um, you know, anyone who I guess has been blessed, and many of you in this room certainly have, uh, have to have acquired a little bit of money over your careers, um, always get approached by people asking, hey, what, you know, I got a great idea, your brother-in-law, a sister, a, uh, a next door neighbor, whatever the case may be. And <clears throat> what I found is I, I pissed away more money than I'm worth today by going down some of those undisciplined roads. When I've stayed within my own core competence and I can uh, mend the, my needle and uh, know what I'm doing, it's one thing. But when I get outside of that realm and that comfort zone, it's something else. So, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to run into Carter uh, Williams a few years ago, well, several years ago, back in 15 or 14. And and, and it opened my eyes to a new thing. I just sold my company, and uh, um, I was looking kind of for new ventures and venues to go into. And, and so I started to learn a little lot more about due diligence, which I wish I had learned, you know, 30 years prior. But um, and so that was a very helpful process. I've over the, these past years, I've invested in a lot of companies, Benson Hill, and several others in this room as well. Um, and, and it's been good. It's been eye-opening and refreshing to. To get outside, you know, the brick and mortar of what you do every day as a commodity trader, I, you know, trading grain all day and looking at balance sheets and looking at weather and, you know, but, but opening up vistas and new opportunities has been, has been really been exciting. And uh, through that process, uh, I've made a lot of good relationships. Uh, we had a barbecue contest down in Memphis, Tennessee every year and 
we'd get you know, a lot of people in the room, Mike Mock, you know, geez, uh, half the room has been down for that before. And it, it's, it's built a lot of camaraderie and friendships and deep friendships that, that transcend just the hi, how are you kind of moments. And so, you know, with those friendships and connectivity have come a lot of good relationships and a lot of good investment opportunities that uh, I've been blessed to be a part of. Um, I mentioned we got our asses kicked down in Brazil. But, you know, throughout it all, the one thing I did walk away with was some incredible friendships. And those friendships led to other things and investments in, in uh, ethanol plants and uh, uh, land in Romania and uh, different different things like that that have kind of worked their way through this, this uh, maze of, of, of relationships and opportunities. Um, you know, but the trust side of it and, 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 and then as you've grown uh, with a lot of these people, uh, it, it's been it's special and it's been very meaningful. You know, lately, uh, Kevin mentioned we, we've been uh, looking at an uh, opportunity with a uh, um, nuclear waste uh, uh, disposal. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest problems facing this country today. Ninety-six percent of, uh, uh, you know, they go out and they use, what? No, ninety-six percent of the uh, nuclear waste uh, could be recycled and reused again and again. And, and, and the technology's there to do it. It's just never been done because, you know, one, one big problem is the government runs it. And, but private industry is now looking at it, and uh, it could be a plethora of value. I mean, there's billions and billions, if not near a trillion dollars of, of value sitting in a lot of these silos that are just uh, sealed up because <laughs> they don't know what else to do with it. And, um, you know, they, that can be reused, and there's, there's gold in them hills. Um, and so, but you know, that's a long-term investment. You know, you're talking 10, 15, 20 years, uh, before you start, you know, from the time you get to the architectural side to the, uh, to, to the operational side and a lot of, uh, government approvals in between. So that's, that's kind of a long-term look. Um, one thing I, I am pretty happy about, I got involved with a company called Uncle Nearest. It's a, uh, it's a bourbon company and then investing in bourbon has been pretty popular, both from a consumer's perspective, as well as, a an investment perspective, but Uncle Nearest, uh, a guy named um, Nearest Green, he was the uh, slave to um, Jack Daniels. And it's rumored that he taught Jack Daniels everything he knew about distilling, and in fact, he created the Jack Daniels recipe. And in his footlocker after his death, you know, generations later, uh, um, one of his great-great-granddaughters, great-great-great-granddaughters, um, found this this formula, and so they created this new um this new bourbon and it checks all the boxes in terms of, you know, having the the right kind of management and and whatnot and uh, and and that's kind of an exciting something different kind of look. Um, I, I guess one thing I've been trying to do is to, is to focus on things that have impact and meaning. Uh, as an example, you know, I, I know uh, when uh, Travis was up here earlier looking at uh, green lightning, I find that fascinating. That technology, um, uh, eco uh, hydro flow. Um, you know, does a lot of work on water, and I think water is certainly something that uh, deserves and requires a lot more consideration as we go forward because it's something that life can't exist without, and and it's, it's going to be coming apparently in shorter supply by the year and uh, being more efficient with that. And so I think there's some investment opportunities along those lines, um, you know, just in terms of uh, sector kind of th thinking. I, I like the energy market. I like uh, uh, ag tech a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Kevin, we've, I've brought a lot of ideas to his table and after he listens to them, he, he'll either say yes or no, but the no's are always around the same thing. And that is, what is it, Kevin? It's not platform technology. And if it isn't something that is platform, it's scalable, it can be unique and driven in different directions, then, uh, you know, it doesn't really have a place, at least in your thinking of portfolios. And I kind of agree with that. He's kind of beat me over the head with that idea over the years. So try to kind of stale on those lines. Uh, and at the moment, personally, I, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the bear camp in terms of the economy right now, so I, I'm trying to keep at least half my uh, powder dry because I think there'll be better opportunities to do things going forward, and uh, I want to have the cash on hand to do it. That's yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's <clears throat> many different ways. I remember Andy calling me not that long ago. I think he's got a buddy or mutual friend of ours. I think, didn't he buy a million dollars worth of... Uh, automatic weapons to just keep and oh work. yeah yeah kept them at the gun shop and didn't he keeps them at the well you, you, you buy them and you gotta you can't take delivery of them physically until you get an atf card 
and every rep weapon requires a, a certain FT, ATF designation, and that can take anywhere from 18 months. I know Gary is maybe, there, there are people in the room, I think, that are, you know, Series 3 gun dealers, so they can hold those, but John Q. Public can. But yeah, yeah once you I get mean, them I, in your name, they're, they're valuable. Yeah, it might, might be a play uh, at some point down the road. I, uh, Jordan, you know, I laugh, or Michelle laughs. Last couple of years, I've sold quite a few. I shouldn't say quite a few. I've sold a fair number of baseball, basketball, football cards, right? We've had this crazy run. And uh, Jay Felton, my friend down there, he, he can attest to. We've watched some crazy prices, seven figures prices. And I had dabbled. I had invested and put money in throughout different times of my life into cards. Jordan's like, Dad, this card market's really heated. I hadn't even looked, and I told Jay, I said, I went out in one of our garages we had, and I probably had, hell, there were probably 15 or 20 Michael Jordan 9s and 10s that had been graded early from PSA that I had kicked loose and sold in the last year or two. And Michelle's like, there you are, and they're like a little kid messing with your cards. And I'd start buying Pokemon cards, you know. <laughs> so I'm buying Pokemon cards this last year, and Michelle's like, are you kidding me or something? I, I'm just telling you, my theory is I watch, it's, you know, like right now, I mean, I, Michelle just got a new Bronco, you know, one of, I bought her an old Bronco. No, oh, they're higher than hell. I, I mean, I bid all the time on BAT, bring a trailer, you know, I love that site, right? So I'm on there all the time bidding on cars or bidding on something of that nature. And you're always paying up now. So, you know, we, I bought a cup, looked to buy a couple of different uh, smoking to bandit Trans Ams. I always thought I was paying up too much. Well, hell, now they're, quadruple what they were um and it's the things that we had as kids that we want back now as toys that are worth a hell of a lot of money so i sit there and i look at these pokemons and i'm like these kids were all nuts about pokemons forever i'm like yeah i'm gonna be the old guy with the pokemons i'm gonna be the old guy that has a monopoly on the pokemons when my kids finally come into some money and want to buy their pokemons back i'm the guy they're gonna buy it from so anyway <laughs> i'm just out no, now michelle laughing so yeah, I've got Charizards, and I've got, I know some Pokemon stuff now, and Jay's down there just shaking his oh, head, God. laughing, but it's usually what comes back around. Where I say those asset classes are different now, this is where you got to be careful in the collectibles market or the art market, because everything's become fragmented, all right? So you got fractal investing. Get on Rally Road, or any of you on Rally Road, the app. So I'm on there all the time bidding on different things. You know, you can fractally own the Declaration of Independence. So I own shares of the Declaration of Independence. Um, you can fractally own your favorite pieces of art. You can fractally own land, i.e. Carter Malloy. Now, do you think, let me just ask you guys this. Let's say I go buy the Dukes of Hazard car. I buy the, the uh, what is it, uh, I don't know, Charger, 70-something uh, Charger. I buy that, let's say, for $200,000, and I put it on an auction site, or I put it on Rally, and I offer it up with fractal investing and let people buy $25 share shares of it. What do you think the price of the car is now going to be worth? More or less? More. A lot more. Because now you go to the masses, and you're selling off pieces of it. Well, hell, the price appreciation like quadruples. I mean, the most famous, pick the, pick the highest price tractors. I want, to create a, I want to create an app like Rally Road, but I want to do it for rednecks. I want to create one that has the Dukes of Hazard on there, has the best old tractors, has the coolest old guns. And we buy them, we put them on there, and we fractal let people come in and fractally invest. I'm telling you, a lot of the collectible market is going to move that way. When well, they start putting some of the old tractors on an app, and you can fractally own the tractor, what's going to happen? It's going to be worth a hell of a lot of money. So I would probably suggest paying close attention to some of these collectible markets because you can see what's taking place in New York and California, and it usually takes a while to get here. But that's how it's going down. So they'll fractally... I send them a 52 Mickey Mantle rookie and they fractal, they put it on their site and they have it, people fractally invest in it. It's worth double or triple all of a sudden. And so we're seeing that happen and providing a lot of support 
underneath the collector market. You would want to think like, damn, this this is crazy as hell. You guys have seen Bear Jackson auctions. Like, you've seen what things are going for. Silly. And you're like, it can't be positive. This is a bubble. It's going to break. Well, uh, maybe not if it, they're going to take them and put them out like, in, and you know, and you can do that, that, that. You invest in cars like that too. You can own shares in cars on the site. I mean, you guys can go there and look. I mean, like I said, I tried to show them on the site that uh, on Rally's site. So you can invest in a Ferrari. You can invest in all these kinds of crazy collector cars. You can invest in wine, whiskeys that are expensive, anything. And they're fractionalizing <clears throat> like Carter's doing with land. And I think that adds a lot of support and a lot of interest. It's getting a lot of interest from people because these kids now, I'm watching Jordan and some of his goofy friends, and I'm like, I want to hold and feel the baseball car. I want to see it in my hands. So I hate <coughs> that I just own a share of it, right? But Jordan and his friends, they sit at bars and like, oh, look, I own some share of this Lotus. I own some share of this Lamborghini. You know, I mean, I'd really want the car, but they think it's cool living online. They post <laughs> stuff on, you know, Jordan, but they post it on their, I don't know what the hell all of it is. I don't know all this meta stuff, but people want to live in this online world and having shares or having those, a piece of the tractor that's that cool on your bio or something is something, I guess. People like it. I don't know. So, but... Yeah, riffing off this maybe for a hot second on this. Yeah. JP Morgan did an interesting study a couple of years ago, effectively on this idea of a liquidity or illiquidity premium. So effectively what they did was they looked at private companies right before they go public. And what you find is that if an asset's illiquid, right, if it's hard for me to sell it or transact it once I buy it, then I'm only willing to pay a lesser price. This turns out to be about 20 to 30% of an asset's value comes because, like, gets removed because of this liquidity mm -hmm. discount. So the example you were giving on, say, the cards is exactly that, right? If I buy a Charizard card, it's going to be really hard for me to sell it. So there's a discount that I get to the value of that. And I think there's two interesting things on that. One is exactly as you're saying, like Rally Road and other places where people can own fractionalized shares of these things. I think it's awesome. And secondly, maybe talking a little bit about the technical side of that, it is incredibly hard operationally to do those sales and transactions. And so that's kind of why these ideas around you know, immutable ledgers and things like that are actually powerful. Consider the idea of title insurance. I think title insurance is the most hilarious and awesome thing I've ever heard of in my life. You buy a house and then a percentage of that has to go to verifying that someone wrote down on a piece of paper 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago that they truly signed the house over to someone else appropriately. I think that's the craziest thing. And so this idea of like title insurance or these ideas of other things that make secondary transactions difficult and challenging, they depreciate the value of assets because they create liquidity discounts. And that's the whole idea of this like financialization of so many of these markets is both A, how do you enable people to get the true value for their assets? And B, how do you set it up? So secondary transactions are a hell of a lot easier to transact. You can think about one other idea on this, which is, so I think a lot of people here like land and I'm pro land. That's awesome. Uh, in the web, there's land too. Like google.com is technically a piece of land or amazon.com is a piece of land. It's a domain registered. And so when you start thinking about digital worlds, we already have native concepts of land, ownership, or otherwise properties. And so when you start thinking about a world that becomes increasingly digital and increasingly on our phones and operating in the cyberspace, it really gives new ideas to the ideas of ownership, what those digital means are. World of Warcraft, a game that I played a hell of a lot as a kid, and I hope many people did too, uh, had the ideas that you could like own weapons or swords or different mounts, things like that. So we already have these concepts, and speaking on behalf of someone who's a little younger, uh, we grew up in these worlds with these digital goods. So yeah, Kevin, I just wanted to say I super agree with you on both A, that these assets will become incredibly powerful, and B, that there are very interesting markets around that stuff. Because we're only growing, we're only becoming more and more digital, and you're only becoming more and more integrated to these digital worlds. So being knowledgeable about those things and at least seeing those as new frontiers, I think it's super awesome. So anyways, yeah, that's my I, breath. I think they sold a Gucci purse, a virtual Gucci purse for more than any regular Gucci purse. Because I don't know, in the whatever world it is, the meta world, the avatar wanted to carry around a Gucci purse and they paid more for a fake one. I mean, virtual one. I mean, than you, a real one. And I'm talking a lot. 
you like Gucci in real life because it's a status symbol. So if people are starting to follow you on Instagram or Twitter, there's a reason you're paying eight bucks for a blue logo. Well, what if you could pay eight million bucks for a gold logo and everyone knows that you're super rich? Maybe you do that. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it totally makes no, sense I that agree. digital goods get value. And that's what I was thinking even too, like on the fractal investing back to Rally Road. I mean, what if you could invest, if I could flip through there like I'm looking at cars, why couldn't I flip through there like I'm looking at bulls? And fractally invest in livestock or fractally invest in, you know, a certain genetic line I want to have ownership in or a certain genetic line of seed even, right? Certain genetic line, companies. whatever. Huh? Companies. Companies. Yeah, companies, What like we're trying to do with Carter at Isola, where we can flip through and, you know, fractally invest in, in things of that nature. So, no, I find it crazily, crazily interesting times. And what's tough as we get older, I preach it all the time. How, how do you know what you don't know? So it's like, you have to go to things like this. You have to network. I told the story the other night, uh, Ben, who did we were looking at a deal on something one time and Ben, I said, I don't like the deal. I hate the deal. And, uh, I don't want to do it. And Ben says, yeah, I'm probably kind of with you, but, but I really like the people. And, uh, he said to me, look, you got to invest in it. Like you're, you're joining a country club. I mean, it's not really the deal. It's the people. We're going to meet these, you know, we're going to become friends with these people like Andy's saying, and other deals will come out of it and other things will come out of it. And it's just like when you come to these conferences and hopefully that's why we try to have a good group of people in the room. And that's what uh, really truly makes the conference. So, you know, I can sit up here and we can talk, we can get fire off some questions on land. Um, you know, I think there's going to be, you know, where do we think the stock market's going? Andy, give it a shot. You're bearish, right? I'm bearish, but yeah. I'm not a stock trader, so. I, no, I, I just think, look, I, I think that interest rates are going to stay high. Um, and, and I think that uh, it's going to hurt earnings going forward. And I just don't see how that's going to recover. And more importantly, and when I look around at the globe, you know, you've you got too much debt to nominize in U.S. dollars. And, uh, you know, we're, interest rates aren't going down anytime soon. And, you know, the last 40 years, uh, contrary to most people's opinions that they're just smart, uh, I would, I would uh, assess um, the majority of uh, the market appreciation to cheap money. In the days of cheap money, you're over with. So the new world order is going to look a whole lot different going forward. And, you know, you can talk about land and a lot of the land appreciation, I think, has occurred because you've had so many people that have, uh, it's the only alternative to, uh, to alternative asset. But now as interest rates start to rise again, you're going to have more and more alternatives for money. And um, I'm not saying that's bearish land. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that it. it uh, I don't think you're necessarily going to see that translate into a, a stock market. I'm I'm bearish. I think we're going to make new lows, and uh, I think it's going to be a self fulfilling prophecy, and the and the Fed's going to stay hawkish. Yeah, you know, I've been preaching lower highs and lower lows, and that's kind of how you see a market stair step down. And that's been your pr pr that's been perspective my, no, the I, whole I time, have, too. I have been bullish huh, for the last 10 years or so, and then two years ago, or about a year or two ago, we got bearish. And But understand, a lot of times, I'm short the S&P right now, a few contracts, but I'm also long stocks in my 401k, I'm long a lot fewer stocks than I have been in a long time. But so I won't liquidate a lot of long-term positions. I'll just go short the S&Ps or the minis or the bigger <clears throat> S&P. You know, it just saves you from washing in and out. Um, but I don't know. I was telling Andy the other night, I said, I remember a year and a half ago, two years ago, and Jordan's learning how to trade, right? So he had a decent year, made a little bit of money. And he's like, Dad, when are we going to buy back in? When are we loading back in? Uh, shoot, that's the big question, right? <laughs> when do you load back in? And I remember a year or two ago, I said, here's the deal, son. I've learned trading through the years when the chopper starts to go down or you feel the choppers starting to sink or the boat's going to go under you throw your least favorite shit off first right <laughs> but when it comes to where it could really go down then uh, you throw you know it's your favorite stuff that's just the last to go so i remember telling jordan i said i don't know we're going to sit patient here but i said they break apple and they break tesla probably going to be looking to throw some money back in. Apple just hit new 52 weeks lows. Tesla's gotten obliterated. Those are the ones everyone loved on the way up. That's where the money was pouring into. Those are the ones. It's like your favorite baseball card. You heard Mark Cuban talk about it a lot. Trade stocks like he trades baseball cards. 
you get rid of your mantles and your Jordans last. You keep your favorite cards till the end. And then when you liquidate those, that's probably the tip. That's probably when you get a little, that's when people are throwing the, the best stuff out. And I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Can Apple go sub a hundred bucks? I don't know. Tesla, I'm probably buy or Tesla back under right around 90, probably somewhere in that range. I mean, we're close. I'm a little hesitant. I tell Andy the other night we were on a call with a hedge fund guy. And he didn't want to touch Tesla with a 10 foot pole because I was like, me and Jordan were talking about getting back in. We made a hell of a run the first time. I was thinking about reowning. And he said, I don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. And I said, why? And he's like, well, my son and daughter in San Fran, and you know, these are all these woke kids, and uh, they don't want anything to do with Musk. I mean, as he, as, and this just happened in the last month or two, you know, as he bought Twitter. And I think a huge chunk of that rally in Tesla was because of Musk. I mean, people wanted to buy him. You know, they're buying him. And that was a big portion of that rally. And now that he's kind of, I don't know whether he's attached to Trump in some way in their minds, or I don't know what it is. But when those woke, woke kids flipped, like Andy and I said, who in the hell was Tesla's market? It was those woke kids. I mean, it, it, that's who it was. I mean, that was... That is Tesla's market, right? That is who they, that is their number one brand ambassador or those kids in San Fran and, and along those lines. And if those kids are turning on him, I don't know. I, I, it's interesting. It's, I, I'm not sure about stepping in at 90. I, I don't know. Maybe they could blister it even more. I mean, you look at Carter shaking his head. What do you think? I, I can't believe you picked that as one of your favorite things on the boat. No. Uh, just... <laughs> what do you think? As a as yeah. a reformed uh, short seller, I, I just can't imagine that being an investable business. Yeah, I, you know, I always looked at Tesla, though, as not a car company. I've never invested in it as a car company because really nothing changed. You're still driving the vehicle from point A to point B. So there's really nothing that changed actually in the business itself, but it's the other underlying ancillary uh, revenue streams, whether it was from the energy credits or the battery business or the battery technology, the open technology that they were creating and other streams that I thought would prove uh, to prov provide all the revenue model, which I still do believe to be the case. I just wonder how out of, like I said, you got to have more buyers and sellers. You got to have more money coming in. I don't know if the kids or the younger people that were once really behind that push are going to come back to him in a big, bad way. I don't know. I'm not if anyone else has any opinions on that, feel free to jump in. I mean, you know, that's so I'm saying I think the bottom's getting closer. When you're seeing Apple kick and some of those, I know Andy thinks we could continue on for another three, you know, two, three years maybe, which I'm not saying I don't know. I I just don't have a, a grip on it. I I do know there's a lot more layoffs coming. There's things happening. I feel like we've reached peak hawkishness. I Meaning I don't think the Fed can get any more hawkish. I mean, you did four raises in a row at 75 basis points. I, mean, I don't think you can get more hawkish. They're going to raise if they need to raise. They're going to watch data. It's just, it's like the war in Crimea. You know, it came out and everything went nuts. Everybody, you know, you reach peak war. <laughs> peak war in the headlines, kind of. Unless Putin hits the nuke button. Uh, and that's what I'm saying. I don't think the Fed can get more hawkish. And that's why, to me, it's like they're throwing Apple out. They're throwing, they're throwing some of these out. They're beating the hell out of them. The Fed's as hawkish as they can be. The market usually leads by six to eight months. Everybody's got money on the sideline. You know as soon as it goes back higher, you're going to sit there like a deer in the headlight, and you're going to be like, shit, I could have just bought it 10% cheaper a week ago. I better wait. And then it goes another 10% higher. Now it's 20 25% higher, and you're sitting there like, are you kidding me? And then you just bury your head in the sand and then just watch it roll. <laughs> because... You can't pull the trigger at that point. You don't want to be the guy that steps in and buys the high and we break back again. So you start talking to yourself. Don't you agree? It's tough to buy. It's like John's saying on the crypto. Say it's once it takes back off, talk to about, let's talk rice. Mr. Daniels, we're in rice. We're, we're loaded up in rice. Let's, let's talk about rice. And what do we think? All 7,500 contracts of it. I yeah. think if everyone in the room bought two contracts, uh, we double the price tomorrow. We're bullish rice. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm bullish rice. I, I think that the uh, uh, USDA, and again, it's just such a small contract. It's, it's not tradable by the masses. But when you look at corn or beans and you got, you know, 100 valid, uh, justifiable uh, hedge type of hedgers on one side of the market and long and short, 
um, you know, it's, it's awful hard. There's really not a lot of transparency, but in the rice market, yeah, there, there's just a few players. And uh, you got, you know, uh, millers in the United States led by Riceland, and you got uh, other smaller millers, and then you got exporters. And then on the, uh, on, on the spec side, you got uh, funds, and funds can get up to maybe 25, 30% of the open interest uh, one way or the other before they go the other way. And um, right now we got a report coming out next week uh, on January 12th, and we're looking at December 1st stocks numbers um, that I think will be very telling, and we'll see if, for, for instance, uh, they're overstated. I think they are, and I think that uh, domestic consumption is less than we um, is greater than, the, than they're giving the market credit for, and they have exports 5 million hundredweights higher than they've ever been. And, and you know, <laughs> imports, they don't, we don't import uh, other than high quality jasmine or basmati rice because uh, domestic rice that goes to uh, Fido and Bubba, the, the, the beer drinker, um, you know, that, that, that tends to, uh, that, that's too expensive to, to feed. So I, I think we're going to come in with a surprise and find that we're not at a, 25 million comfortable carry out, uh, 100 weight carry out, but we're closer to 10 million. And we consume probably 10 million 100 weight a month. And it's uh, six weeks from the end of the crop year, August 1st, to the, when new, new crop harvest starts. So if we come out with that kind of a number, I think we're, uh, we're, we're, we're too cheap. And uh, fundamentally, I think it feels like the farmer's pretty much sold out. You got the biggest mills stopping it and taking delivery of it. And, they never do that right after harvest in November and now again in January. So uh, I'm bullish. Yeah, and, and one of the things, Andy, you know, there's a lot of psychology involved. When Andy and I were talking, he's like, look, you better get it on now because it's going to be hard psychologically to pull the trigger if this thing takes off to the upside because it's going to go in a hurry probably. If, <laughs> if, if, right? If it plays out the way we see it. And a lot of trading and investing is psychological. Don't you agree? It's how you... I mean, you beat yourself up psychologically. It's just like marketing our crops and things of that nature. So that's why I say you got to be careful saying you're going to buy on a break because are you really? I mean, are you really? I mean, if the market, let's say, just gets hammered, the reason it gets hammered may be so scary. Are you really going to step in there and be the buyer? I mean, that's kind of the question, right? And then if it takes back off to the upside, are you going to are you are you going to be willing to be buying as it it moves higher and higher? I mean, it's just you know the I remember a guy saying to me, he's like, I hate buying low and selling high. I like buying high and selling higher. And you know that's a theory, right? That's a, that's a play. Can you do that? Buy high and sell higher? I don't know. A lot of people have a real hard time with that. That's why a lot of people don't pull the trigger on land. Because you don't want to be the guy that buys the high. So your your dad said, Oh man, we, I, I could have bought that a year or two ago. Right, it's always thinking back in the rearview mirror. It's 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 what makes it so tough. It's called recency effect. We all want to think it's it's like it was gonna be. So you think, man, I remember when that ground was twenty five hundred an acre. I, I'm not gonna pay four thousand. I'm gonna wait for it to pull back. Okay, sure, maybe. I mean, maybe. How many times do those opportunities happen to you in your life? Not many. We've lived through. You know, that's why I tell the kids. I said, listen. Here's what you're prepared for in your life. You tell your grandkids or your kids. When we have breaks in housing, like you had in 08, there's a few other times, go buy ground along the oceans. You only get one or two pops at them. And that land is prime beef. Andy and I kick ourselves. I, I was so close to pulling trigger three or four different times on places in Florida. And got right to the, the hurricane insurance, where I got pissed about the hurricane insurance, just didn't buy it, and watched these things just go from a million. Some of them that were trading a million are now trading 10, 12 million. And I've got my money sitting in, you know, some other thing. I'm just like, man, that is frustrating. And Andy and I have seen that. We're just like, you know, but it was scary at the time. When it was breaking like that, it was just scary. I told Michelle, uh, my wife in real estate, there was a period where I said, anything that fell below 200000 in our hometown I said, I'm just going to go around and get finance land and just buy every single thing that falls below. And she's like, you're crazy. You're crazy. It'll never come back. You know, it's not going to come back that much. Now, I wouldn't have held on clear till now, probably. <laughs> I would have probably turned it pretty quick. But I'm just saying, it, you know, it's scary to be buyers into, uh, into, into the abyss. So I tip my hat to the people that are able to do that. But you got to think psychologically about yourself and if you can do those things. And that's the same with your marketing, don't you agree? I mean, it's... It's all about your next five, six moves and how you can handle that. So let's open up some questions for the panelists and 
see where we're at? Anybody got anything? Yeah, let's start out with, uh, and that $620 land rent uh, that we were talking about early on, uh, was the owner paying any fertilizer cost or any input cost? No. What are you seeing happen on that front, Chris? What are people doing with the custom farming, some of that jazz? Yeah, that's been a very big topic of discussion here the last couple of weeks is custom farming. And um, there, there is a larger appetite for custom farming now. Um, a lot of younger guys are looking into it. When their planting times and harvest times are getting compressed, they have to keep those machines running longer. Um, you know, and it obviously benefits to keep that machine running as long as possible during the planting and harvesting season. So, um, but we'll see custom contracts that come through where it says, hey, we want, you know, you to cover half the lime costs every three years or, but typically what, what 90% of what we're doing is just straight cash rental rates. And that farmer makes that payment, you know, twice a year throughout the life of that lease. So. Um, one other trend that we started seeing this year that I didn't touch on earlier was the farming community has taken to this adoption for a very unique reason. So we got contacted by a, by a pretty large farmer and he said, hey, I, I'm buying a piece of ground in a different state. I want to put it on your platform because I think it's, its current rental rate is, you know, in half. And so we're starting to see farmers in the community to say, typically they say, well, I want to buy more ground. I'd love to buy more ground. But they're typically looking 30, 60, 75 miles in their core competency in their area, where now we're seeing farmers go, oh, I can buy that chunk of ground three states over at a premium where I know it's getting beat up on rent. I can put it back on the site as soon as I close, double the rent, get that forced appreciation. So we're actually seeing the farming community start to utilize our platform for investment purposes, which we find pretty unique. Uh, next question is regarding uh, if the panel could comment on institutional buyers in the farmland sector and whether that's increasing or decreasing at the moment. Who wants it? Dave? Yeah, you bet. So uh, the, the short answer is, is the institutional appetite is incredibly high, right? This, this is uh, the demand pull. Um, in, in we've been fielding calls for uh, 24, 30 months now with uh, an eye on inflationary characteristics. Farmland is an asset class. Uh, has just incredible correlation with inflation. And uh, a lot of folks have, you know, heard about this and looked at it. And, uh, you know, they found out it's a little bit difficult. We're talking family office types. Uh, but the bottom line is, is the capital is lined up within the institutional funds, uh, family offices, high net worth individuals ready to get into the asset class. And, you know, they've been a little bit cautious in, over here on this run. And uh, from a just raw return standpoint, have had a hard time competing uh, at some of the prices that are out there. Uh, as we see some of the um, income elevate, uh, rental rates uh, is certainly part of it in certain parts of the country, in that cap rate starts to, to increase a little bit, then they're ready to go. The capital's there, a lot of cash capital, not necessarily worried about debt. I'd uh, second that and just say we're, we're early. Like, there's $3 trillion of farmland, $40 billion of private equity money here. It's in, we're, we're not in private equity ourselves, but, but that's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of money. So you think there's way more interest yeah, you, to come from look the at, institutionals? I'm with you. In any other opinion. asset class out there, look, look at uh, office buildings, look at malls. It's like 80, 90% institutionally owned. Just about every other large asset, hard asset in the world is double digit percentage uh, institutionalized. And we're talking about one, one and a half percent, maybe two if I'm crazy wrong in, in farmland. So yeah, I, I think that that trend of those, those larger mega players coming in uh, is, is still very early. And Kevin, on, on this theme, you know, you mentioned earlier, you heard that 80% of Iowa farmland yeah. was owned outright. Uh, nationally, it's, it's actually even more dramatic, right? So $3.8 trillion asset class at the end of 2022, 14% levered. Really? Wow. Yep. Wow. It, the financial the financialization construct is uh, right at the forefront here. I'm saying it's in strong hands. I mean, for sure. So we've had uh, multiple questions regarding uh, why solar farms lease instead of buy. A lot of folks have been getting triple offers, etc. And so why is that? 
Yeah, I would say um, with leasing, uh, technology is going to continue to change. And so like putting, there's a several year due diligence period uh, before actually like solar panels would go potentially on your land. And so it takes companies like buying the land outright is great. And, but it's also an asset that you all want to hold on to. Everybody wants to hold on to it. You want to pass it down to your kids. Um, so the lease makes a lot more sense in terms of like deal flow. You can get more going through with these larger groups. Uh, they can close quickly and um, using data and like all the information we've talked about, the, the lease makes uh, a profitable more sense. What, what are some of the 20, solar? 30 years too. Yeah, what are some of the solar leases that we've been seeing lately? What yeah, are some I mean, of the prices? I know it depends on the area and the, and the positioning, but what are some of the higher ones you've been seeing? There's a really cool marketplace called Landgate. You should check it out. Uh, but we, we, have a whole, uh, we have a whole data map that will tell you exactly what your land's worth for solar, for wind, for whatever what you, you What are you seeing? At. You heard anything? Hey, Chris told us, you know, 600 and some dollar rents. I mean, what are you seeing on leases? Uh, all, over all, the all across the board. I was looking uh, around here and I was seeing 600,000 bucks an acre. Like, yeah, I was seeing that. I've seen several people uh, that are friends that are probably in this audience that have been offered, have gotten ink thousand dollar leases. I yeah. mean, in multi year, big, fairly big tracks of ground too on that solar, correct? Yeah, and I would say like every solar developer has different goals. And so they're going to use and like look at it to make sure. Uh, the other big thing is like the local incentives. So like what different counties are willing and states are willing to offer uh, can make an area that might be smaller, more profitable, even if there's less sun. Uh, Minnesota, for example, I was looking at that. They've got no sun, but their incentives are through the roof. So like a small track of land makes a lot of sense up there. Um, so it's it changes everywhere. And like also how close you are to a substation, transmission line, all those things. Uh, it's a mix and... There's a bunch of different data points that we can look at, and I can help y'all through any of that if you want. The next question is, uh, Carter, you got some, it says Acre Traders got some offerings in Australia. What makes that country investable in any other foreign opportunities that you're eyeing? Yeah, we're, we're really excited about Australia, uh, primarily because there is a developed water market there. So water is a, is a priced asset. And so you as a, as a landowner and a farmer have real visibility on that. Uh, so we're, we're excited about Australia. Uh, I was told to be controversial. While I don't think I can top these two gents to my left here, uh, I will say that I'm personally pretty excited about California. And uh, I'm not discussing investing in their people, uh, nor their water, nor certainly their government. Uh, but it's a huge place, right? Iowa, Indiana, Illinois, it's bigger than all three of those states combined. And so there's a lot of diversity in, in ground and, and type of ground out there. And if you have good water, as all the other stuff comes offline, we are, we are bearish on the water situation in California, to, to be clear. But there are other places in California where there's really good water. If you're growing almonds somewhere where there's really good water, and the guys with the bad water are all pulling almond trees out of the ground, what do you think happens to those prices of almonds over the coming five and 10 years? Uh, so that, that's a couple areas we're, we're pretty excited about, uh, both, both within international communities uh, as, as well as here in the US. Yeah. And I, uh... I work with Carter and them on some things, and I went down to Carter's conference. And I thought it was interesting on their play, uh, the company's play into Australia. And listening to the Australian people talk, they're basically saying, Carter, they're what, 10, 20 years ahead of where California is currently? I guess they went through all these water problems and the water problems we're seeing in, in parts of Kansas and Nebraska and other places. But Australia has somehow figured... Yeah, some you know, type of solution to this water. Well, we, we tend to love uh, letting government regulate things here. And, um, and, and, you know, I'm a much bigger fan of markets setting price rather than government setting price. And so in that case, there's, there's actual <coughs> contracts that you can buy to, to gather water. So where in California, you've just got to be uh, wildly more diligent. So that's, uh, Kevin and I have talked quite a bit. We've got a, we built a tool called Acres, uh, acres.co, acres.co is the, the website where uh, we spend most of our days, frankly, just going and digging in uh, pretty, pretty hardcore on individual tracts of land. And we, we built that ultimately to understand and value land just so people, so we could know what land was worth in all these various pockets of, of the U.S. Uh, we've now rolled that out, and most of that's entirely free. So, so all you can see it here. Yeah, and I, that's what intrigued me with Carter because he had said early on, you know, he had made some mistakes buying, th you know, how difficult it was to get research and data and good, good, accurate research on ground. So Car a lot of the tools his computer engineers on his team have developed that Carter uses to make buying decisions, he's now making available to the public. And I like that because 
I want to use the tools as well. So I, I, I think that's, uh, you know, critically important. So for sure. How long do we see the uh, employment staying strong given the current environment uh, with possible recession, uh, recession, inflation, and uh, high interest rates? I'm happy to at least comment on this. Uh, on behalf of a tech worker, and the tech world has definitely gotten hit lately, um, I, in my opinion, the general unemployment rate, but other people on the panel, please feel free to comment. I believe the general unemployment rate will actually still maintain low for a while. I actually just think you'll see more high paying jobs pull back. Amazon just announced another fresh round of layoffs. Google, et cetera. Google actually doesn't do layoffs, but they have increased their stats for underperformers. They typically trim about 3% of the organization per year. They're now trimming around seven. Uh, you've seen other companies like Apple. So I think you've seen a large portion of particularly the more high income workers. And please note the companies like Facebook, Google, the average person there makes about 250 grand a year, right? So you're really talking about tech workers probably being hit first and foremost in, in, in a lot of what's going on in the economy economy right now. The reason I don't think unemployment will drop too much is just because you have a lot of sectors that are labor intensive that are coming online. Think of assisted living care or think about other things that just involve last mile delivery or things like that. Um, I think these are sectors that are growing. Cost of labor is pretty cheap. 15 bucks an hour isn't that terrible. Uh, and so I think realistically, until you have a lot worse of an economy, you're not going to get that sea hit. Uh, there was actually a really interesting article in the Washington Post about this that suggested if you actually look at the income disparities going into 2008 versus today, uh, you're actually seeing that like typically recessions are terrible for the poor and then just moderately an inconvenience for the rich. You're actually seeing that invert in this one where actually most people on the lower side, because they got so much from the stimulus, 40% printing of money, things like that, they pretty much have at least a better buffer here, whereas you know, more affluent people that may have like larger amounts of money, things like that, uh, they're getting hit a little harder. So anyways, that's my idea on it. Could be totally wrong. Please don't take my financial advice. No, yeah. <laughs> no I, I agree. When Simplot had us down, uh, their family asked, you know, could we see the recession roll over into a depression? And, you know, I just simply said, yeah, you know, a recession is, is uh, when you lose your job, a depression is when I lose mine. So I don't think... <laughs> We're going down to that path anytime soon. I, I totally agree with John. You're seeing the tech sector all in the headlines. That's only about 4% of the workforce. I mean, tech sector isn't anything. Like John's saying, um, your hospitality, your service sector, I don't foresee that breaking. The Fed already came out and said they're trying to cut 4 million jobs. I mean, they've, they've said it many times. We are trying to knock 4 million jobs out. And they're hoping to raise rates high enough, squeeze off some of the capital uh, spend and lay people off. I will tell you an interesting thing. My daughter's company, I'm supposed to tell you, my daughter's company uh, that she's at, they laid off architects in San Fran and Chicago and a couple of, and I, when you see a big, big architect firm that's doing projects, multi, they're the ones doing the Kansas City airport, they're doing a lot of Fed projects, other things, but when they're laying off people, like I told Annie, that's, that's a little worrisome. You know, that could mean that they're there could be some sustainable drag here for, for a couple of years if people are canceling some big projects or at least putting them on hold. Uh, so, I, you know, I think we could see some things, more layoffs in the cards. Like I said, the Fed wants to cut 4 million jobs, so you're going to see the layoffs start really starting to scream. So, Are we seeing any uh, – one of the new trends in hunting and leasing uh, contracts going forward? Have you seen increases in cash rents, et cetera, longer terms? Uh, yes, actually, we've, we're getting a lot of requests. Um, you know, strictly we started out as just straight cash rental row crops, but we found a lot of these absentee landowners lived out of state. There's a huge, huge demand for hunting leases, and um, we partnered with a broker out of Indiana to start. And you know, it was just one of those things that it was. You know, the first initial meeting was what do you see around here for, you know, a price per acre for hunting ground, you know, timber ground for deer, turkey, whatever? Well, the going rate's pretty much 25 bucks. I think the first six farms where the landowner wanted to lease the timber out for hunting, we hit about 60 bucks an acre. So it was almost three times what their going rate was. And what, what we found, just like anything else, on the ag side, we're opening up the pool of bidders instead of it just being the local co coffee shop, 
when we open that bidding pool up to a, a network of farmers within a 60 mile radius or 70 mile radius, the same thing is true on the hunting lease side of things. Now, I mean, uh, you can ask some of the guys at the table that, that handled them. We were doing leases in Illinois and for hunting, people were driving up from Mississippi. We were having people come in from New York paying $20,000 for 500 acres of timber to deer hunt. And it was just for them and their buddies to fly in for a couple weeks and hang out and deer hunt. So, you know, it's no different than Landgate with solar. It's no different than any other way to maximize the ROI on your ground. And, and I think, you know, if, if you're an absentee landowner or you're a farmer that, that owns a bunch of ground that doesn't even hunt, it, it's just another way to maximize your return, and, and the results have been absolutely staggering to see what people are willing to pay. So, Do you jazz them up a little, Chris? I've seen some of those monster bucks you and Brad been pulling we off. We encourage right? good photography and photos, <laughs> yes. So it doesn't Crockett hurt, doesn't hurt to have giant deer. So, but, yes, a lot of demand. Perfect. And what will... Uh, what impact will global ESG policies have on U.S. ag economy? Who wants it? Who wants that one? Jay Felton, anyone? <laughs> I'm not sure. All right, let's go to the next one. Crypto was touted as an inflation-proof currency. However, it's not increased in value as inflation has. Do you think this is just due to extreme volatility in space today, and at some point in the future will it be a hedge against inflation? Yes. Um, a brilliant question. I appreciate whomever asked this question. Uh, okay, so a couple of cool things about crypto. So first is, it is technically uh, an inflation hedge. Uh, there is 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be printed. There are 56 millionaires in the world. So not every millionaire can have a Bitcoin, uh, which I consider technically a good thing. I think Bitcoin is definitely... Right, so Bitcoin's classical pitch is that it's an uncorrelated asset, that you should have a little bit in your portfolio to 5% because it's an asset that's not the same as the other assets, and modern portfolio theory says that you should buy a little bit of everything and cost-adjusted you do well. Now, recently, you've definitely seen that people have sold Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin has gone down, or at least my net worth has felt that. Um, so I think it's fair to say, like, yes, it is a risk asset, but I think that's a little unfair to say. In bear markets, people take money anywhere they can get it. If people have Bitcoin, if they have Dogecoin, if they have any stocks, they'll sell it. Probably don't want to sell their land because it's a little hard to get back. Bitcoin, you can kind of buy back, right? So I think recently you've seen Bitcoin very correlated to the market and very much a risk asset, and I think that's fair. But I don't think it's fair to say that, generally speaking, that thesis is untrue. Um, you've actually seen that correlation break down recently really hard. Bitcoin's leveled off, pretty much trading between 16.5 and 17. I think today it's at 16.8. Uh, and it's traded this narrow range, even though the market itself has kind of continued to decline in different ways. So, so the question is, is Bitcoin an inflation hedge? Yes. Technically speaking, you can say 21 million Bitcoin, 56 million millionaires. Uh, and then I think secondly is that generally speaking, Wallace, it's definitely a risk asset and people have been divesting for it. They're taking cash from everywhere on the table. So it's a little unfair characterization. I think when you start to look forward, it's going to still maintain to be an uncorrelated asset. Having a percentage of your portfolio in it is not a bad idea. Okay. Is the U.S. dollar, this is a question for John also, is the U.S. dollar stand at risk and how do you see it playing out? Uh, does that say stand at risk? Is the dollar going away? Uh, uh, I was in a really cool, I was with a group of guys last night, and they had a really cool expression where they were like, oh, you know, Bitcoin has failed because you can't go to your car dealership and buy a car with Bitcoin. But the fun fact is that I didn't know this. You cannot buy a car with dollars either. If you walk into your dealership with a hundred grand of US dollar bills, uh, they will tell you no thank you. So I guess what I'm saying here is I don't think Bitcoin is gonna become a medium of exchange. I think it's a little too volatile. I think the asset price goes up and down a little too much for that to happen. I do think the US dollar serves a point. I think cash is pretty powerful. And so I think it's a valuable thing. I don't think it's gonna go away. I do think two things are going to remove power from the dollar. First, the dollar will become digital. That is unquestionably true. 
there will be a U.S. digital equivalent of the U.S. dollar. In crypto today, we call those things USDC, USDT, things here, right? They're digital goods that are backed one for one with the U.S. dollar. The value of that is that you can transact in a digital world, right? I can have money in a wallet. I can give it to you. I can send 100 grand right over there. I can, you know, pay Jordan for the amazing hats that they have at Ag Swag. Uh, you can do all these things really a lot easier with a digital dollar. That's why every country in the world is exploring this. China is way farther ahead the U.S. for this. China started experimentation on a digital renminbi back in 2014. They've already done billions of dollars of circulation for this thing, so they are way ahead of us on the ball here. Um, and actually, China's digitization of their wallets is way better than the U.S., uh, it, it's actually an interesting fact for those that are interested, and apologies for the interesting factoids here, but I feel like them. Um, Alipay is actually one of the largest mutual funds in the world. Uh, it's a money market fund effectively set up where people that have money in China uh, are just effectively their normal bank account also serves as a money market fund. And they do these things because, well, they hit financialization a little later than the U.S., so they're natively digital, right? Everyone has an Alipay account there. Um, and so it's very different. So one, I think the U.S. dollar will become digital. It won't just be physical cash. Two, I think this is more of a geopolitical question. The U.S. has weaponized the dollar. Using OFAC and other sanctions lists to use and you know, effectively cripple company, countries that have U.S.-denominated debts and interest, uh, they've weaponized the dollar hard, and other countries realize that, and they know that. China has been building out the Bank for International Settlements, notably between them and Dubai. That is growing power. So less and less people are using SWIFT. More and more people are using the BIS, things like that. Uh, so I think the U.S. weaponizing the dollar has made other countries very scared of it. There was a great comment earlier about the fact that a ton of debt worldwide is USD-denominated. That's been the trade for decades, right? You guys are traders far smarter than I, and you guys have been in this for a bit, so you guys know this. But the trade has traditionally been long USD, right? Buy assets that are U.S. denominated because, well, they can't go from 1.3 1, 1 to 5.4, right? Uh, unfortunately, the U.S. is now kind of flying in the face of that, right? By weaponizing the dollar, it's now becoming an instrument of war, so other countries aren't going to want to touch it. They're going to want to use their own sovereign currencies, Bitcoin, things like that, that the U.S. government can't shut down. Um, anyway, so yes, I think the U.S. dollar is great. I just think it'll change and it'll get a little, little less strong. So buy some Bitcoin. Yeah, Andy, you and I are, what's your opinion on the dollar? I mean, I think the dollar holds a lot of importance for people in the room. Well, I, I, I'm concerned about, you know, the, um, the, the, the Petro Yuan and uh, a lot of the other activities that are going on. I mean, China has been over when meeting with all the Arab countries and uh, cutting deals and um, buying and trading in uh, their currency. India is doing the same thing. And, you know, the, the, what gave the U.S. dollar its value was uh, uh, Roosevelt back in 19, what was it, 45, when he went and met with the king on the, uh, in, in one of the uh, um, warships uh, right off the coast. And, and uh, when, but, but when you take away the dollar as the denomination for, for global uh, uh, petro, uh, that's, that can change things. And that, you know, uh, civilizations have gone away with uh, w when they lose that status as the uh, you know reserve currency. So I'm concerned about it. I think in time the, he's right. John's right. We're going to see a uh, a push towards less um, dependence on the dollar and more countries wanting to uh, do it via through commodities or their own currency or gold or a combination of the above. But China's hell bent on doing it to you know taking away the U.S. as being the the reserve currency and uh, Russia and a lot of other countries are too. So it's going to happen. It might take time, but, you know, things start slow and then they move fast, like the end of the roll of toilet paper. Yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> let's uh, end it with uh, everybody give us their, their uh, favorite trade, favorite investment idea, what you may think. You know, and it could be simple. It could be complex. It could be easy. So, you know, let's uh, give it a shot. Who wants to uh, start us up? John, tear it up. Uh, my favorite investment idea, uh, I'd probably say two. Um, so one is, all right, I'll give you guys kind of a wild story because I'm in crypto and we apparently have to have wild stories. Um, in crypto, once invested 50 grand that turned into 10 million. Um, that was a good, that was, that was a very good deal. That was a good one. Unfortunately, it went back down to zero. Um, that was not so good of a deal. Um, so I guess I'd say... My best investments have been those that I have been, I think you said it really well, 
psychologically aware of what's going to happen, right? The ones that you've gotten into slowly and been willing to get out of slowly because you just make long-term convictions. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, that's not like a cool answer. Any tip? Oh. Any hot? Uh, I do think crypto is starting to be at a bottom side. Um, so for those interested, please hit me up and I'm happy to talk at much greater length about this and kind of give different thoughts. But I think dollar cost averaging exposure into those fields would be a really smart move. Like I've been starting to accumulate Bitcoin, Ethereum, things like that, starting about a month or two ago. I'll probably continue doing that for the next eight months. Perfect. Just to be uh, contrary, and I'm going to take the other side of John. <laughs> I'm, I'm long dollar short crypto. Let's oh, go. There we See go. you in a year, John. Short side. <laughs> Mr. Felton, what uh, what do we think, buddy? I'm J Jay. I I uh, just interesting on when when things are going to tip because all like everyone else, I I can't wait to read the report every morning to see what Kevin has to say. Um, but one of the I've heard the same thing from a half dozen of different companies and 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 folks that invest, and they're really looking to see when the unemployment rate is higher than the interest rate, and when that happens, the money comes into play. That's at least what, that's how they're playing it. That's something I'm tracking. So uh, it's not really a specific tip, but we're all looking for when to move. And that's when some of the, some smart money's moving at that point. Yeah, perfect. <clears throat> I'm currently long uh, copper. I think copper, longer term, I'm going to try and just stay in the position. So when I tried to stay in positions, you got to trade small. I mean, you can't go out here and go nuts to stay in position. You get shook out. So I try and build smaller positions, buy a little more on the breaks. I think copper longer term, maybe two, three years out, maybe not even that long, just because of where we're at. It's building one of those similar stories to silver where it's just, you've heard a million times, Andy, I mean, on the silver side, and we're hearing similarly with copper, there's just no way they're going to meet the copper demand as we turn the corner uh, with electric vehicles and try to go green. So copper's easy access for me. I, I don't... I don't have a lot of, I don't know how to have a lot of great, easy access to some of the other rare earths or some of the other, I could do it through some other companies, but then you're messing with companies and company balance sheets. You don't know if they're cooking the books on you. So I'd, I prefer to stick in something I can kind of trade easily, which is copper for me. I like copper. I also like the back end of natural gas. I told you we had a great run in it last year. I'm underwater in it right now. We're taking some pretty good heat on it. I like the back end of natural gas for everybody in the room that's trying to hedge fertilizer. If you think fertilizer could get smoked or head higher, I'd buy the back end of natural gas. I'm just talking like Ocno of Deesa next year. Trading sub four, four bucks now, you're in three, 370. I'm just telling you, it's an easy hedge. 340. For three, 340 now? That's painful. 328 in the uh, November, October, I think. Andy and I are both long the back end. Uh, uh, you know, like I said, it's a smaller position. I've been working into a bigger position on the, on the break, the moron trade, you know, put more on, we say. But I, I'm telling you, it, is, it, it was great last year as a hedge against uh, fertilizer when it took off because the natural gas exploded on the backside. So I do like that as, as well as a uh, position in the commodity markets. I'm long rice, like I said, a few other things. And, uh, you know, dabbling, playing around in the collectible space, looking at a few different collector vehicles and, and different, you know, trucks have been hot. The Broncos and the Blazers have been hot. I think things, like I said, all you got to do is think of what we like. Like he told you, when does everyone come into money between age 50 and 60? All right. So do go back, you know, and when these 30 year olds become 50 or 60, whatever was hot with them. And it isn't going to be cars probably. Michelle and I have dealt in antiques uh a lot through our lifetime she loves to go antique shopping and doing things like that but you see antiques go out of favor you remember you guys have seen this some antiques stay hot some don't some go out of favor so it's it's more along the lines of the kids and when they turn 50 to 60 year olds what are they going to buy you see you know and as the boomers uh, age and, and sell things off i think there's you know a lot of changes there as well so chris what do you got uh, me personally, uh, I'm a real estate guy. I, I don't invest hardly anything in stocks or commodities. I, I like owning assets. Um, I've done very well with um, like duplexes. Um, I think multifamily as interest rates continue to rise is going to be a good bet. Farmland, if you can buy it right and throw it on a you know convenient site and get the rental rate up, um, it's always a good idea. And uh, 
I'm really thinking hard moving forward after this talk about Pokemon, so. <laughs> I like your style. Said with a straight face. <laughs> That's it. Dave? Yeah, probably not quite as actionable as you're looking for, although I, I may flash a few Charizard cards that my right. son has in your direction. <laughs> but, you know, one thing that, that we're pretty excited about is actually row crop farmland in Alaska. Wow. Uh, there's some really interesting uh, policy initiatives going on, and uh, the governor will actually be joining us at the, the expo virtually uh, next week. And they had some uh, major food security issues when they shut down the ports in uh, Portland and Seattle. Uh, in the, the COVID uh, issues. And so there's some things that are um, creating some real excitement from our perspective on um, getting some things rolling up there. Perfect. Jensen? Yeah, I think, um, I think just like a lot of the panelists here, like land, if you can buy it, that's awesome. Hold on to it forever. Um, see what the highest and best use of it is. That'll change across the country, but it's always a solid bet, I think. Perfect. Shane? Hey, I think uh, along with what you and Andy are thinking about rice, you know, I live in the, the heart of rice country, and I know that there uh, seems to be a bit of a drop of our acres, and also it's coming spring, depending on what fuel prices and fertilizer are. I mean, we could see a reduction in acres, but uh, still long my rice crop from last year, and I want to sit on it for a little while. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Carter? I told you, I'm, I'm betting against John. <laughs> <laughs> you actually actively shorting or sorry like would you actually yeah would you actually short no not not crypto because it's uh a room full of people like you that are a lot smarter faster talking than i am and and the downside is endless uh in, in shorting crypto i i do um actively have a short portfolio though and i i, I do uh, short equities quite quite a bit uh you know actually a theme we were talking about earlier uh healthcare i'm oh, sorry uh, for, for headcount within companies, uh, there's a lot of HR software out there that's being sold into specifically technology companies. There's a number of public participants there. So both for HR management, uh, they're called HRIT systems, as well as uh, payroll modeling. So or payroll, so think ADP, paychecks, these types of companies. Uh, a lot of them have outsized exposure to tech companies. So as you see all the layoffs happening, like John was speaking to earlier, you know, Salesforce cut 10% yesterday as well. Uh, businesses that sell into those businesses uh, can can be at real risk. So I think there's real downside in some of those stocks. Yeah, perfect. Andy? Um, I, I'm going to coattail with you on uh, natural gas. I, I like crude oil because I think at any given time, uh, any black swan event could be uh, incredibly bullish on that. And uh, it's a great way to have a what-if trade on. Um, I like rice, obviously. And... Uh, I like being short the uh, S&P and the NASDAQ. Perfect. I, uh, I think that's going to be it for today. I, that's it for the conference. I appreciate everyone coming. I think everybody had a great time. Met a lot of good people, new faces. Appreciate you guys. So until next time, Thanks, appreciate Kevin. it. Thanks. Safe travel. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> the Alaska place.